it's one great big long uh, uh, mood. Each piece is, is one great mood thing, but those moods are interrupted at times. It's a real spacious type of music, otherworldly type of music. It's got a, a dreamy feeling, and it's um, Industrial Symphony Number no. One or The Dream of the Broken Hearted. It's it's uh, it's about a, uh, a broken heart. We were commissioned by Brooklyn Academy of Music to put a work together for the opening premiere of their uh, New Wave musical festival that they do every year, and they wanted us to do the the, the first show. Uh, David and I to produce and write. We told him about this thing that we were working on called Industrial Symphony Number no. One, and I guess just the name and the the idea of it uh, got them going. And they said we want th that thing. And um, so then I got off the phone and Angela and I looked at each other and we, you know, all we really had was uh, the name Industrial Symphony Number no. One. So we had to get to work. I kept in contact with Angelo throughout the years, you know, about four years past, and I do different industrials for him and commercials and just about anything that came along where I'd find singers for him. And uh, one day he called me up out of the blue and said, I'm doing this film, it's called Blue Velvet, and I need this real angelic type of singer for it. And, uh, you know, of course he would never consider me because I was a belter, I was too loud, I was too brassy. Julie recommended a few girls and tried it out, and David wasn't thrilled. He rejected like six of my singers, which really, I, I got real irritated with him. And I, I was being sarcastic, actually, on the phone. And I said, well, just let me do it then. And he said, well, okay, okay, you do it. Well, then, you know, he called my bluff and the terror set in. And I, I tried to, I called him sick. Um, I tried to change the key. Um, the, the music had no meter. It was just this spacious, vast melody without any breath without anything just just kind of ominous so um, what I would do I'd call my mother and I'd, I'd set the phone down and I'd, I'd say okay mom how's this sound you know <laughs> and uh, he wanted me to sing it in an accent but then not in an accent so uh, those were the type of directions given to me and we worked in my office and she positioned her voice at a certain place and just we went into a studio and did it and it was just fantastic. David heard it and flipped out. She's got a, uh, a great voice, and uh, when she sings uh, soft and pure, it's um, just what the doctor ordered. You know, your music's going along, and it's making pictures form in your mind. And um, if you can put those pictures, if you can build those pictures and put them up and play the music with it, it, it should, you know, if it gave you a feeling inside your head, it, it might do the same thing, you know, to others. And um, so you kind of go this way. And um, to make a, just an interpretation or, you know, intellectually try to understand them, it's sort of not what it's about. I really believe it's a sincere attempt on David's part to be very intimate and romantic. And uh, what comes out on the surface is very intimate and romantic and beautiful and ethereal. What's going underneath is repression and paranoia and uh, fetishes and obsessions. And uh, that's why it's not white wine music. That's why uh, there's a lot more to the music than just the, the beautiful melody or the beautiful voice. Certain uh, words need certain sounds. and. Uh, and and that's how we kind of started. Um, Angelo would interpret, you know, these words, and um, uh, you know, a kind of a feeling or a mood started growing. And then later on, you say, well, we've got three songs that are have this kind of feeling, and the word floating, you know, came up, uh, and the word night, and and um, and it was all kind of uh, uh, dreamy. David would come in, and I'd be sitting at the keyboards, and and David would say. Uh, you know, just noodle around at the piano. And I would noodle, and David would, would hear a few notes, a little motif, and say, that's great. Now, develop it, and kind of 
move it in this direction or that direction and, and David would just create this uh, uh, verbal mood. One of David's you know, famous things that, that he told the sax player is, you know, Al, this is a guy from the symphony, you know, Al, you know, big chunks of plastic, you know, can't you play that? And, and Al knew what he was talking about. That, that's when it gets kind of scary. I mean, he played big chunks of plastic. It starts with a film clip. There's just many, many, many things that have to happen at certain times within it, even though a lot of it is, you know, pre-recorded. And uh, it was like uh, very, very tense because there were a couple thousand people uh, in the audience for two shows, and we only had um, a day and a half to install the entire set, rehearse everything, and, and uh, you know, get it all, you know, worked out to this, you know, kind of like precise way that has to be when you, you know, go in before the public. We would get into this kind of heavy, uh, uh, you know, violence, fire, and and uh, and sound effects, uh, heavy winds, and and stuff like that. And musically, you know, we would get into that and, and all of that underscore and what was going on on stage. Baby dolls, you know, being dropped, a uh, hundred of them or whatever it was, burned from, from, from war and fire and you know all of those kind of sick, sad things. And uh, and out of all of this, you know, uh, catastrophe, uh, it would suddenly fade and cross fade into a beautiful thing from Julie's album. She would come down floating, and it, it all worked as one piece. Well, they had me floating the whole time. I forgot where I was when I was up there. It was all dark, and I was up in the air, and I was singing, and there was fog all around me, and all I could see was this one real bright light way out there. And I just thought, am I dead? You know, he would love for me to just levitate naturally. <laughs> and I haven't been able to do that yet, David. I'm sorry. But uh, that's, I think that uh, he's always had that in his mind, of kind of this little strange doll floating around in the darkness and then just a glimmer of light shines through and then it goes back into darkness. When you do something, uh, you do it, you know, like as, as good as you can and then you you, you, know, you have to uh, leave it up to fate from then on and it's uh, sometimes things don't work out so well and then sometimes uh, things work out, you know, really well like in, in Twin Peaks. I think it's the funniest show I've ever seen. <laughs> it's like, uh, and uh, I had no idea that all of America and, and, and all the little corners of America and the heartland of America, that people would get into the Twin Peaks. Angela writes the scariest music. I mean, really scary, creepy. Creepy is a good word for it. <laughs> you know, I've seen all the writing and all the critics and, and all the people are calling and saying, well, you know, the music is just setting up so many of these moods and it's like, you know, the, the music makes you want to kind of watch and stuff like that. Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I really don't take the credit for that. I, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's totally by accident. Sometimes what you're going for anyway is when the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And, um, and, it's, and it, it's hap I've seen it in other films sometimes where you get a thrilling thing in your soul. And or in songs because you know that just these chord changes at a certain time just um, it just does something you know to you and um, so you strive for that and it's super important and it's very tricky. Underneath the surface, yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on with David. That's for sure. I like David Lynch's work in the beginning because of his humor and his sense of humor and how dark it was and. Uh, I, I never looked at David's work as being real scary, but uh, more as a real dark, dark comedy, or his dark vision of, of life. And uh, I had no idea what he was like. I met him a year later after Blue Velvet was released, and uh, there's Jimmy Stewart from Mars. <laughs> Ideas are, um, to me and to you know all of us, I think, uh, the most important things. And um, so, but we don't really understand, you know, where they come from. But thank goodness they they come along every now and again and they pop into your into your mind. 
And um, for me, I found out that um, coffee and sugar and a comfortable seat um, in a well-lit, clean place um, helps uh, these ideas come along.